Open your Bibles to Psalm 37. But before we get into the Word, um, I need to, we're going to do something a little bit different. You're going to give me some advice. We're going to pull our resources and knowledge here. Because I want to make a point that what we're talking about tonight is a little different, but um, who's, I need a young person who volunteer. Don, I can't offend you, right? Don, it's also too possible to offend Don. Thank God. Thank God. Don't you love people? Can you come forward? Yeah. All right. So first I need you to run this. Uh, we're going to set that on one of the speakers, maybe that speaker there. And then yeah, you're going to come down. Don is a new Christian. How many of you believe that God has the... Yes, how many of you have been like the Christians? How many of you believe that God has a best, best, best for your life? He does have in his heart a mind of a high calling. Okay. So we're going to put you down here. And we're going to say that chair over there, that's where you got born, wherever that was. And now this is where you get born again. You come up here. Now what's five pieces of advice? There's one sentence in long. Um, long of how he should get from his place of new birth, as a new Christian, to the high call. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I want to tell you something more people don't go than do. I'm sorry. Sure. Awful lot of people drop out. I'm not saying they go to hell, but okay, Bill, what's yours? Dive into the Word. Dive into the Word. Couldn't be better. So number one is dive into the Bible. Good. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Couldn't be better. Dive into the Word. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the next piece of advice? He's new. Let's get there. Worship. Worship. Excellent. I love this. This is very good. Y'all are well taught. So you're going to get diving into the Word. Filled with the Spirit. You're going to worship. Pray. Thank you, Willa. Pray. Talk to God all the time. Excellent. What will be number Okay, we're going to have six, it looks like, just a minute. Mr. Morgan said, witness. witness. Tell other people. Yeah, that's why you were saved was to help others. Terry. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Get connected to a church. Those are six good ones, aren't they? Man. Yeah, Nathan. Say, walk in love. Your father is a love God, and you were born in love. Walk in love. And I, you don't do all this in the next 24 hours. No. <laughs> Now, I'm going to add one thing from Psalm 37, and this is one that, I mean, how do you, and that is, every day, after every day, keep living this godly life. And of course, everything you told him, I understand everything you told him was how to live the godly life. Yeah. But don't get frustrated and impatient with God when sometimes it seems like every day is every day. Because every day that you, this is exciting, isn't it? But every day you live a godly life, and every day you glorify God, and every day you say, Lord, I want that more than I want anything in the world. I want it your will today more than I want. If I was going to add number eight, can I add number eight, just put it in my own words? I would say, guide through the words of the word. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Worship. Pray. Walk in love. Get connected to a good church. Witness, and I left one out, right? But all those, and then after that, I would say every single day. Everybody say every single day. Every single day. Say God, God, I want what you want more than what I want. Thank you. You may be seated. You're a big help. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's make it all for me. Amen. Now you say, well, that was we didn't, we know all that. The reason I gave you that kind of introduction to the psalm is because you almost never teach about this psalm because it's so peaceful. It's not impressive. But this psalm is a blueprint for the big picture of your life. We go to Psalm 37. So add everything else we talked about into it. But look at what David says. And by the way, when if you look down at about verse 20, 25, he says, I've been young and now I'm old. So this is written from the perspective of an old man. Did you know that when you get older... You see certain things more clearly than you did when you were a kid. How many of you can agree with me? You're over 35, right? Okay. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. David has the big picture perspective here. Look at what he says. He said, don't fret because of evildoers. Don't be envious. 
toward wrongdoers. So the first principle David gives for being supernaturally blessed is to stop getting upset with people that do wrong. You'll be around people that do wrong as long as you're here, right? For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. You know what he's saying? He's saying don't envy them because they're sowing for their own demise. Now, this may be something we've looked at before, but to me this is very helpful. Because in God's sight, every day that you say, Lord, I want what you want this day more than I want anything else in this life, you are, whether you know it or not, moving toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. People have prayed themselves into the baptism of the Holy Spirit and never heard of it before because they just kept saying, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. I'm, amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So he starts out saying, don't get upset with people that are doing wrong. They're going to, why are they going to wither? You know why? Because they're sowing a seed for withering. Verse 1, it says, don't fret because of evildoers. Evildoers are going to wither. They sow seeds for withering instead of seeds for blessing. Now, I know you know this. And you say, well, okay. Genesis 1, 11, it says that God said that all the plants should bear after their own kind. We have one Genesis 1, 11. It says, every plant bearing seed. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruits, trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with the seed in them and it was so. So we know that if you plant cotton, there's no way in the world that you're going to get endive. You're not going to get soybeans. Okay. Then if the other verse in Genesis is about animals. It says, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. So what does that mean? That means cattle always have cattle. Sheep will always have sheep. Your cat will never have a kid. I mean, your, your cat will always have a kid. Your cat will never have a monkey is what I was trying to say. And it wouldn't even come out. It was so crazy. Cats don't have monkeys. Babies have babies. You didn't come from monkeys. Isn't that a comfort? <laughs> I say, well, we all know this. I know that, but here's what I want. I'm hoping you to get you to see something. Something I need to see is that every single day that you live a godly life, and every single day you say, there is something so powerful about every single day saying, God, I want that more than I want anything else in this life. I want to stand before you fully approved. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want for this day. You see, if you want what you want, the day you stand before him, the way you get there is by wanting what he wants for each day. Yeah. Hallelujah. So we see the Lord has instituted a lot of consequences. You don't get mad at evildoers. They're sowing for their own demise. Now look at verse 2 again. It says, they'll wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. I'm back to the, yeah. Do you know something? Sometimes it doesn't look like that. Do you know why? If you decided, I want a Christmas tree farm, so you go out. And you buy a farm where they have sowed soybeans and corn. Are you going to be selling any Christmas trees this year? No. What are you going to do? If you want a Christmas tree farm, you have to plant some trees and wait, what, 10 years? I don't know how long, but at least 10 years, right? Even if they were good, fast-growing trees, it'd be 10, 15 years to get a nice tree. Now, sometimes people, in their wickedness, sow seeds. Yeah. And for a little while, it looks like they'd be doing just fine. But when you sow... Wickedness, you're going to reap wickedness. The good news, I'm not trying to emphasize that. The good news is that when you sow godliness, guess what? You're going to reap godliness. Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Edwin, Edwin Lewis Cole, but he had a magnificent men's ministry, and it just seemed to come out of nowhere. And what happened was he'd been teaching men for a long time, but Pat Robertson noticed him about 82, 81 and gave him a national platform. And people were coming up to him saying, Ed, you were just an overnight success. And he said, if I was, it was the longest night anybody ever saw. <laughs> you know why? Because for years and years, he was going to family camp teaching men how to be godly men. Yep. Years and years. And they got a little radio program in years and years. Yep. I heard Joyce Meyer say the same thing. She said, somebody said, you just came out of nowhere. And she said, honey, I was somewhere. I was somewhere paying my own expenses to meetings that they'd love to teach. Then what am I saying to them? Do you know what they were where she was somewhere? Do you know what she was doing? She was living a godly life doing everything she was supposed to do for that day. Yeah. And the way 
The way you get to where you want to get is to really, tomorrow morning, really want what God wants for that day. So let's, he's, he's going to start talking about this now. Look at verse 3, Psalm 37, 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Isn't that interesting? What are you going to sow a good harvest of? I, I just think I'll plant some faithfulness. I'll go teach those little kids. I'll teach the little praisers if that's where they need me. If they let me praise the word, teach the worship word. I'm telling you, sowing seeds of faithfulness will grant you a harvest. Hallelujah. They were, I'm going to be talking tonight about the power of a consistent godly life that wants God's best every day that you live. Where you cultivate faithfulness Thursday, tomorrow, and Friday, and then Saturday, you get up and say, God, here I am. And you say, didn't that get boring? Well, the wonderful thing about Jesus is he takes the mundaneness out of the everyday. If you live in the presence of God every single day, and you get with him every morning. Is this his mercies are fresh every morning? He's fresh every morning. Yeah. He's too creative to ever be same old, same old. You'll never have a day in his presence that's boring. Have you ever come down around this altar and prayed until we really got in his presence and said, well, that was boring? No. I don't think so. Uh-uh. Every time you come, it's too exciting for words. Who wants to leave? And so, okay, hallelujah. Yeah. So verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. There's something I like to say about this. It's my best illustration. You know, you get up every morning and you say, God, here's my life. Your kingdom come, your highest will be done. I want what you want for my life. Right. Well, my mom, this is, you know what you're doing? You're planting a crop here and crap. Pretty soon you just get waves of blessing. My mom loved sweet corn. I mean, she loved sweet corn. And she wouldn't just plant a crop of sweet corn. She would go out there as early as you could possibly survive and start planting. I, I may be giving her a hard time here, but this is true. And one week later, she'd plant another seven rows, or however many rows we have. And then she'd plant more rows. She would plant until it's probably no way it could come to fruition. But I'm telling you, we ate sweet corn all summer long. Why? Because my mom just kept planting good harvest. She'd have the best sweet corn. Yeah. We ate sweet corn. And you say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, there comes a time that says, cast your bread upon the Lord, on the water, and it will come back to you. It comes to, well, you've cast so much bread out there that every wave's got something. Every day's got something marvelous because you've been planting and planting and cultivating. Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. Now look at verse 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I never saw this today until today, that that's a choice. Because you either are going to delight yourself in the Lord or you're going to seek the desires of your heart. You say, how do I know? Because half the time when I go in prayer, I go, I'm going after what I want. And sometimes I don't have any fellowship at all. That's what it used to be. I'm okay, I'm tired of that. <laughs> but you know what? When you delight yourself in Him, He'll give you the desires of your heart. If you delight yourself in Him and worship, His answer, His harvest is the desires of your heart. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Now, this is so important. David is an old man writing this song, and he's going to describe supernatural over-the-top success by the time you get to the end of the 40 verses. And he says, commit your way to the Lord. How do you commit? That is when you pray the Lord's Prayer every morning, and you say, why do you keep saying that? Okay, okay, I'm done. Every one of us knows we've got to read the Word. We've got to pray. We've got to walk in love. I am coming to a point where I truly believe that one of the top-notch things to get you from here to where you want to go is to the very beginning of the day tell God, come your kingdom. May I be holy and kind and thoughtful and just like Jesus today. That's the kingdom of God. Be done your will in my day. Where every day for this, there is no way you could live out the will of God for your life every single day in this life and not end up at the high calling. And there's no way you could end up at the high calling and not hear about tomorrow being in the will of God. You're not going to... I know a lot of people, they, they love the grand and glorious final prize, but you don't count all there. You walk there. Okay, so it says commit your way to the Lord. That means, Lord, today, here's my whole 24 hours. What's up? What's the agenda? Trust also in Him. 
and he'll do it. <coughs> Hallelujah. What does it mean, trust? Also. First, you commit your way. What does it mean to trust also? That means that you honestly think that what he has dreamed up for you in life is better than the dream you had. I don't know too many people that are absolutely certain about that. I just want to ask you right now. Do you believe, everybody listen to this, do you believe that the dream God has cooked up for you is better than the one you got cooked up? Yeah, it really is. But you'll never shoot for it every day until you become convinced of it. Can you pull up that scripture I gave in Ephesians? It's Ephesians 1, 5, and 6. He talks about the kind intention of his will. Read this with me. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. How many of you become totally convinced? Okay, read this too. To the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Let me ask you this. When God, did God dream up the plan of salvation? Before the foundation of the world, he had the whole concept in his heart. How good was that? How over the top was that? If I had tried to draw a plan of salvation, I would have never have dared put his son as the ransom. And I would never have dared say, well, now they're not going to just be um, friends of mine in the garden. They're going to be sons and daughters and joint heirs. I'm going to just make it where it's going to be better for them than if they hadn't sinned. And you know that we've got it better than Adam and Eve did. Yeah. He came down and fellowship with him in the, in the cool of the day. We got him living inside. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what he dreamed up for us in salvation was infinitely better. Yeah. And I would have never, ever, never submitted. If I had a proposal, I would never have submitted that one. Let your son take all my diseases and go through the scourging so I don't have to be sick. Who would dare? Everybody say he's an over-the-top God. How many of you agree with that? You agree that salvation is better than, okay. Then how many of you know that the plan he has for you, even if you are afraid of that plan? I know there's people afraid of the plan. Well, the reason you're afraid of the plan, if we go back a verse, because you never believed in the kind intention as well. Look at it. It says he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. I heard somebody, I can't forget, who was telling me the other day they were afraid to give themselves completely to God because they heard about how Adele had to go to Guatemala. <laughs> yeah, I know, it is funny. Her family's been trying to get back, her back here for years. She said, they said, come home. She said, I am home. And her heart's in Guatemala. Right. She's happy, happy, happy. She's treated like nobility. I mean, yeah. And you say, poor Adele, no, no, no. She's just going to live there and then go to glory. And she's so happy. She didn't want to come home. They had dinner for her birthday. And I mean, just brought the whole town out. They love her. She's not hurting. God does not have subtraction on his heart for you. He said, you seek me, I will add. Verse 6. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the new day. That means you're, if you just keep living faithfully, your accusers and those who condemn you and find fault with you will be a long way off. You know why? Because you live like this, the glory of God will be your portion. I, after Sunday's message, I just kept finding glory scriptures everywhere. Did you know in Isaiah 61, you can look it up later, verse 19, it says your God will be your glory. The spirit of that chapter, that famous chapter where it starts out, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to, you know, send the redemption, you know, freedom to the prisoners and all that. It says, your God's going to be your glory when you find that salvation. Yeah. Hallelujah. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. You see, the reason I, I wanted to share this psalm with us because Gordon and I, sometimes we said it was our favorite psalm. It got us through some very, very difficult times. Went through a time right before we started the church. We had an employer that didn't come from heaven, I don't think. Really bad. Really, really bad. And he would just annihilate him. And he was such a sweet guy. Gordon had taken. He came home one day and I saw him walking in. And his shoulders were all slumped over. And then I saw him stand at the door and stand up straight and smile. And I said, Rob Day, huh? I can always tell. Now, we wanted so bad. This man was supposed to be a Christian. 
We want it so bad to go to people over his head and tell them. We want it to, we want it to get even. Don't you know your flesh does, especially oh, yeah. if somebody you love? And Gordon said, no. He said, I, I've got to pass this test. And God knew, or Gordon knew that God was calling in the ministry. And somebody gave us the book, Tale of Three Kings. And if you've never read that book, everybody, you've read it, Don, who else also has read it, Nathan, have you read it? The Tale of Three Kings, or the, the Three Kings are Saul, David, and Absalom. And how you relate to authority. And David treated authority over him with respect, even when he was trying to kill him. Remember? Saul threw, literally threw spears at him. And Gordon told me many, many times, because when we first entered the ministry, it wasn't always easy. You know, I get treated so well now. <laughs> but, you know, and he said, I said, how do you do this? How are you so patient with these people? And he said, they're just little kids. And I said, yeah, but no, he said, I passed the test with so-and-so. And that was a test. God was never going to let me be a pastor unless I could learn to treat the little ones kindly. Now, I said all that to say, I don't remember what, but I'm sure it's going to come back. When you want what God wants more than you want anything in the world and you pray for it, God will sometimes let you be tested. But I, I know what I start to say. This psalm was the psalm. Two things. The Tale of Three Kings, awesome book, not very long book, that will change your life and how you, he respected authority and then how he treated Absalom. Even under Absalom, he didn't try to go out and, and do the more. He said, he said, take the ark back. God will decide if he's finished me. You, you let authority rest lightly in your hand. If you have to grab authority and, and, and coerce people to bring them under your authority, then it's not God-ordained authority. And David understood God-ordained authority. This psalm and that book helped him us through the hardest times in our lives. Because if you read the whole thing, just keep reading it. Verse 8 says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. It'll lead only to evil doing. You know what that means? You sit around and stew, you're going to lose your top. And it's going to cost you. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. Yet a little while, the wicked man will be no more, and you will look carefully for his place, but he will not be there. I can't tell you how many people have tried to give us a hard time in ministry. So, you know, sometimes you try to take over the church, you know. Like, but you know what? I don't know what I mean. One time it was happening, and I said to Papa Dallas, you know, this is what's happening, and they're going... After the affection to the people, we don't know what to do. He said, how many times has it happened in Gordon said, three or four? He says, where are those people? How did it Gordon? We thought. We, were, we had no clue where any of them were anymore. I don't mean they died, but they weren't. God gave us some space. Here. When God gives you the best place you will ever be is in the center of the will of God. There is no way you're ever going to come up with a plan that's better than the will of God. And the thing, you say, you've got a lot to get across tonight. No, I've got one thing, and I super, super, super much hope I can get this across to you. In addition to the word and prayer, walking in love and worship and having a good church and anything else I'll leave it out, I believe every day of your life, you need to tell God, God, I want what you want more than what I think I want because I trust the kind intention of your will. Amen. Do you feel the power that's here right now? Yeah. You know why it's so important to the Holy Spirit that you get this? Because so many folks settle for something other than God's best. And it is doable. Everybody say, this is doable. This is doable. We're talking tonight about a life consistently lived, lived in the Lord and for the Lord, sowing good crops. I don't want to go too much longer because we're going to break up in groups of three or four, at the most five, and I want every single group when it's time. You have somebody that you don't know, unless you know every name here, find somebody you don't know. That way it's how you stay appointed. But then we're gonna pray one thing. We're gonna pray for God's absolute highest will in our lives. And sometimes, something can be resisting that, all right? If you're really sick, I promise you that is not God's highest will. You know, okay, we'll be there in a minute. Let's see if there's anything else that I don't wanna I did say this, I like it so much. The secret to enjoying serving God year after year, when sometimes, have you ever done something and you've done it before? And you've done it a lot of times before? The way things keep from being so everyday and mundane is to keep the Lord's presence in it. Yeah. 
If you walk with him, he's worth walking for. I don't care if you've done it before. If he's there, it'll be happy and exciting. There's nothing mundane about Jesus because there's too much life in that river that flows from the throne. A day lived in his presence is scintillating. I don't care how many times you've done it before. Can I tell you a secret? I don't want to ever go on vacation. And, and I'll leave y'all at home, but I don't want to leave God at home. I don't want to go to the most beautiful beach on, on the earth and not have my Bible. And my dad kind of wondered about me once. I mean, I'm sitting out there reading the Word. He says, why are you reading the Word? I mean, it was sort of like, that's your job. And I said, too much of the time, it is my job. I just want to be with Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, if, he, if that isn't the joy of our hearts, then we've lost the best part of life. Christians who live powerful lives. I mean, the really amazing thing, let me, okay, I said this. When you've lived a while, you have a different perspective. Every time, about every 10 years I go through my bookcase, that's really bad. I want to tell you, every 10 years when I go through my bookcase, I find some ministers that messed up. Tears my heart out. And the one thing that I am absolutely astonished by by some of these people, Oral Roberts, Kenneth Copeland, before you criticize Kenneth Copeland, you listen to him for a while before you. I wouldn't have the faith to do what I'm doing with apart from Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. This, this week they've had Marilyn Hickey on. She's 82 and a half years old, wow. going for God. Clearest mind you'll ever hear. Turn her, turn her on, one of those broadcasts this week. Sharp, really sharp. You wouldn't want to try to keep up with this lady mentally. And they say, how long have you got such a great memory? She said, oh, I've memorized so much of the word. It's kept my mind alive, my brain alive. Hallelujah. Now here are these great giants of the faith. And I look at them and I say, Jesus, I don't know what they've done right to go this kind of distance and still be on mark for the high calling of God. At 75, Martha Copeland is 80, she is. Others, oh, Norval Hayes is 93 now. I guarantee he's right in the center of the plan of God for his life because that's what he wants. And, and you say, do you feel sorry? I never feel sorry for anybody in the center of the plan of God. There's a glory there. There's an authority there. There's a power there. And when so many people just kind of, well, they get lured off by, you know, I'm not going to mention it all, and you know, it's like, I said, Lord, they wouldn't even have to rewrite this article, just give the name of one other pastor that's had an affair. That stinks. That stinks in the nostrils of God, and it's not necessary, because there's only one thing that will lead you open to that, and that is walking away from your first love of Jesus Christ. If you're in tight with him and in love with him, his love is so much better than anything else, you'll just spurn sin. But I'm convinced that part of it is telling the Lord every single day, oh God, I want to stand before you having done your whole will. Christians who live amazing lives don't do it in a day, or in a month, or in a year. You know, I was thinking today, I, I think a lot of Christians would prefer owning a firecracker factory, I mean, a, we call them firecrackers. Fireworks. fireworks, yeah. I'm from Ohio. We had all kinds of fireworks. They'd rather own a firework factory than a Christmas tree farm. Because those trees blow slow, and at least if something happened at the fire and the whole thing exploded, it'd be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't seen people like that? Just something going on. Well, let me tell you what. If you get to that place and the devil gets you bored, you're in big trouble. Because the devil will come along with some, woo! They said, well, how do you keep the excitement in? You've got to keep the excitement. You know, how many of you are married and you want to keep the spark alive in your marriage? But you better. Now listen, you've got to keep the spark alive with you and God. Well, your time with him is the best time of your day. Amen. That's not supposed to be drudgery. No. That's not supposed to be, oh, we're going to read the Bible. No, that's supposed to be, that's supposed to be a fun time. Christians who live powerful lives, you look at um, William Booth. We gotta, we gotta quit. We got like two minutes. We gotta quit and pray. Yeah, who many know who William Booth is? You know the Salvation Army is people that is people that feed people, and clothe people, and that's good. And they still are saved, most of them. But the original Salvation Army went through the streets of London with big brass bands and big huge drums, and they had taken bar songs and written gospel words to them, and they'd get the the hardest part of London, and they would get rotten tomatoes thrown at them and rotten eggs thrown at them, and all kinds of things. Um, unbelievable what they suffered. But they started a movement that encircled the whole globe. By the time he died, there were Salvation Armies in Australia, 
and in the Orient, and the United States, Canada, they're still strong. They had an army that influenced the whole world, and it's because he didn't go for 10 years and say, okay, I've done my part. He says, where's the high call? And he just kept getting higher. Even after, Paul, after his wife, Catherine, went home, he still went for God. Yeah. Christians who live powerful lives just keep going. If you want to live in that glorious place called the perfect will of God for your life, you have to fight your way into it a day at a time. And you say, oh, what's the fight? It isn't much of a fight. It's a one, one little fight when you first get up in the morning. Yeah. When you say, I believe your will is better than mine for today. It's the plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what? You can't do that without it up there. Yeah. Because you've got the Holy Spirit. You've got the Word. You've got friends to keep you accountable. You've got everything at your disposal. You've got the Internet. If you'll get on YouTube, you've got some of the finest preachers on the planet preaching at you on YouTube. It's such a gold mine. Yeah. Forget the silly songs. I mean, <sighs> if you want to live in that glorious place called the perfect will of God, you fight your way into it. It takes about two minutes or less every morning where you say, Lord, I want what you want. That's why I did. And then you enter his rest. And you say, maybe... I live today as in heaven, thankful, thoughtful, holy, and happy. And today, I want your, your divine intents and purposes to be carried out in my life here. You say, isn't this over the top? Well, the only people that get there are the ones that are over the top. It takes an over-the-top passion for the will of God to do everything you're called to do. It takes what your family's calling you crazy. I mean, we've been called crazy by the California crew, by Gordon's family for staying here when we couldn't hardly keep the lights paid. When they said, why are you staying? They said, God, I said, God said. But people up in Maryland said, why did you go to Fredericksburg? There's people there. Why are you in Colonial Beach? And we said, because God said. My mom and dad said, oh, are you sure? Even God would ask that of you? Yeah, we know what God said. And you say, you feel sorry for you? Uh-uh. Oh, man, this church's best days are ahead. Let me tell you something. I don't spend a lot of time praying for a move of God right now. The move of God is already on its way and happening. Do you know who I'm praying for? I'm praying for the people in this church. And I pray one prayer, and I pray it over you all the time. If you don't pray it over you, I'll just get somewhere else. I'm praying it over you. Every day. Oh, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, align our lives perfectly with your divine purposes so that when this revival hits, we will be strong, spirit, soul, body, in our marriages, in our will to serve you. Get our minds so perfectly aligned with the will of God that we will not fail you in the most crucial hour. Now, if you want to pray for a move of God, you can do that. But right now, I'm more concerned about us. And you say, why are you doubting my love for God? No, I know the devil. And the devil, when he sees something going to happen, he can't stop it. So he tries to put in pressure on people to be someplace other than where they're supposed to be or to do something. Whether... And you say, you should get, hey, listen. I fully intend for this church to do everything it's called to do. And I'm going to at least pray that your life is going to be perfectly aligned. That you'll be whole in body, whole emotionally. So that when people come in and it's their first time here, you're not afraid to look them in the face. You just, you just grin and love them. You ever notice our teenagers? Boy, they don't have an insecure bone in their body. Psalm 34, 37, 4 says, You can't truly delight yourself in the Lord. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the delight of your heart. I want to look at that one more time, and we'll just have to quit. Look at this. It says, this is really a one or the other. You're either going to spend your time delighting yourself in Jesus or you're going to pursue the desires of your heart. But he said, if you'll delight yourself in me and just let the desires rest like that, you'll get them. I promise. Isn't that good? Yeah. How many of you can say, I just really, truly, incredibly much want to achieve the high calling of God in Christ Jesus for my life. Whatever I'm destined to do. We got some hands up. If you want it, just raise your hand. Now this is what I want to say. We're going to pray. And you pray whatever's on your heart. But the smartest thing you can pray for each other. Is bring my brother into alignment with the divine purposes of God. Bring my sister. Amen. So what I'd like you to do, if at all possible, get in a group with some people you don't know. Because that's how we learn each other's names. And it's a lovely thing to get